Welcome back to the show, everyone. So, this may surprise you, but the Epic Games Store is actually not profitable. It'll be fun to dig into that one. A few other stories going on as well. Starfield, in large part, has been kind of forgotten by the Game Awards, which is a little bit embarrassing for Xbox, who uh, are kind of continuing quite the streak that they've got. Also, some live service developments. Seemingly, it ain't just Rocksteady who are being slammed by that, and a few other things as well. So, let's kick it off today with the Epic Games Store. All right, this is all happening as Google are facing down Epic in uh, in the court of law. This is basically because of Google's objection to Epic's desire to have a third-party store, an Epic store, on the Google platform. The whole story here is basically, be it the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store, obviously percentage of all of that money goes towards the platform holder. So from Epic's perspective, they're saying, hey, can we just not put our store on your platform? Then people could buy things on our store and then you wouldn't get money. Which obviously, if you're Apple or Google, you really don't want to have happen. And per The Verge's reporting from that court case, the Epic Games Store in the year 2023 is still not a profitable thing. Now, in a way, that's not the most surprising thing in the universe. Epic have been pretty public, mostly via Tim Sweeney's Twitter account, that they do intend to operate this store at a loss until they achieve the maximum market share they can. Tim said this in 2021, Apple spins this as losing money, but spending now in order to build a great profit business in the future is exactly what investment is. It's equally true whether you're building a factory, a store, or a game. What I find particularly interesting about this, though, is that this all comes from a different era. I mean, this is 2021. Obviously, games are doing really, really good in that year. They're also doing good from an investment point of view. And this is basically when Epic were riding high, making a lot of investments. Obviously, we've seen Epic then spin out some of those investments recently and, uh, you know, slash their workforce. So it seems that this cavalier attitude um, has somewhat came to bite them in the ass in uh, in the current day. Now, what this gets interesting is we can contrast this with some of the reporting that came from the Apple trial back in 2019, right? Where it turned out their original plan, I mean, I just have it up here on their uh, market share capture, right? 50% of all PC revenue if Steam doesn't react. Now, in a way, Steam has reacted, right? Um, Valve have got better terms if you are over certain thresholds. I believe it's 10 and $50 million of revenue, which obviously will matter to the big AAA companies, which can bring the overall Steam cut down to 20%. Um, and a few other things, like the deck kind of having a little bit of market expansion going on. They then predicted 35% of all PC revenue if Steam did react to them, and then under the winding down of the exclusivity plan, they would be building to 20% of PC store users, and then settling into 8% as their baseline, which certainly does represent a pretty damn large decrease in uh, in their ambitions there. So with the plan of basically thinking about what's got a lot of wish lists and then trying to uh, get an exclusivity deal thrown in that direction, now they're kind of just offering devs cash in better sales terms. They've got the Epic first run program that is basically open to everybody now. And the way that that works, right, is that if you exclusively sell your game on the Epic Game Store for six months, you get 100% of the revenue that you earn during that period, which on the face of it does sound good, but to be honest with you, that's only really good if you want to do a kind of limited early access and if you already have a sizable audience that you can bring to that platform. Uh, You really need to have like a strong get out the vote like campaign with your user base um, on Epic because the Epic Store itself, honestly, it brings next to no traffic and uh, everyone in the industry sort of knows that. Now for developers who already have games, they've also launched the Now on Epic program. It basically means if you bring your products over, then you'll also have 100% of the revenue for six months. And that is very much just Epic trying to have a carrot that's a bit less aggressive that maybe angers uh, customers uh, less. So I suppose they're playing a game that is more about offering people a good deal and less throwing humongous bundles of cash at people. And maybe that tells us something. Maybe that original, uh, you know, the original plan with the exclusives and those really big payments, maybe that has just ended up not really hitting the sorts of ROI that they want. Maybe it didn't hit the long-term sustained growth that they want. As an example, I picked up Total War Troy for free on the Epic Game Store and that happened, and I've basically not touched the bloody store since, 
right? So you, you do have to wonder, um, maybe they see this where they're basically sacrificing future revenue share for like six months. They probably see this as a more sustainable thing, obviously now in light of how they really seem to have had to tighten up their belt. That's not all they're doing though. There's widely believed to be two things. The first one is essentially at least helping or paying for PC ports. Uh, this is heavily rumored surrounding the likes of Kingdom Hearts and some other Unreal Engine titles. But the other side is Epic Games Publishing, and this is actually where Alan Wake 2 comes in. Uh, so yes, Alan Wake 2 was done via Epic Games Publishing. Uh, you could sort of see that then as, uh, yes, it will probably help the Epic Store, because that's where that game happens to be in PC. But... Of course, it is a game that is out in other places and will be earning money for them in other places as well. Overall then, thinking about Epic's recent layoffs, their divestures, it seems pretty clear to me that like Tim Sweeney's big money faucet is um, absolutely uh, closed in comparison to where it was in the past. And from some things I've heard in the grapevine, Honestly, like even the likes of Microsoft Game Pass, it's a bit harder to get on and the deals don't seem to be as good. It does seem that the industry is transitioning just a little bit away from that kind of crazy freebie time. Well, I suppose unless you're Amazon recently, they um, they got rid of 180 people um, within their games division and uh, they've basically said that when they look at everything, the free games on Prime Gaming, like that's pretty much the main thing that consumers actually want. So uh, I mean, why spend money doing other things when people just kind of want to go and get the freebies, which I suppose in terms of manpower are not going to be the most expensive things in the world to do. Now, in terms of things that are not the most expensive in the world, uh, running these channels isn't the most expensive in the world, but it is a uh, active team of a decent few people, and that actually does get to be quite expensive. Ad rates on YouTube have absolutely plummeted, and we are trying to, I suppose, much like, uh, say, the likes of um, Yahtzee and all the crew over at Second Wind, uh, you know, we're kind of trying to build that long-term sustainable future for us. That that is bellular.ghost.io. That is our platform. That's where you can get the five days a week loading screen newsletter, which will essentially have you completely covered in the news. Also, all of the research reports, as an example, that's, uh, you know, like the team creates for me to be doing content here. You'll get access to those. In fact, uh, often before I get access to them or even uh, do a recording based on them, as well as a bunch of other things. And it is the best way to help uh, us in our mission and keep the content flowing. So big thank you to all of our members who have supported us there. Um, you can check out the link down below. And with that said, the forgetting of Starfield. Starfield is a game that absolutely has not made a dent. And when you take a look at game of the year, you would usually expect the big Bethesda RPG to be there. But instead, what do we got? We got Tears of the Kingdom, Super Mario Brothers Wonder, Resi 4, Spider-Man 2, Baldur's Gate 3, and Alan Wake 2. Yeah, no Starfield. And to be honest with you, that is uh, hardly a surprising thing. I certainly wouldn't nominate Starfield for something like that. I mean, maybe I liked it a, a few percentage more than a bunch of the internet, but I must admit, I have not felt much of a desire to come back to it. Something really for me to do with just characters being flat and uh, a world that does end up feeling profoundly uninteresting. Uh, for Xbox, though, this is a rather awkward thing. And that's because if you take a look at this uh, lovely chart that has been compiled, um, yeah, Xbox have not, they have not got a nomination for this um, for a long time, going all the way back to 2013. Pretty brutal. Now, over on Twitter, they did say that they're pleased to announce 10 Game Awards nominations across eight categories for their first party studios. They highlight how you can play Starfield, Sea of Stars, Forza Motorsports, Party Animals, Hi-Fi Rush, and more. And hey, in all seriousness, in fairness to them, there is actually some good stuff there. They don't have these like massive first parties that absolutely like claim the cultural mindshare, but um, there are 11 nominees playable right now on Game Pass, and in many cases, like, say, Sea of Stars, Forza, Hi-Fi Rush, they're actually bloody excellent games. Now, Starfield did get one nomination for Best Role-Playing Game. <laughs> I think we know it's not going to win that. I have just a little suspicion that Baldur's Gate 3 maybe will win that award. Uh, yes, but anyway, this has basically got the internet talking about the sort of ghosting uh, of Starfield. Uh, to me, though, it's, it's not exactly a ghost thing. It is just that this has been a surprisingly forgettable game for many people. And ultimately, I, I think we need to work out like why that is. And I would say that the Bethesda-like seems 
became so present that they essentially shattered parts of the space exploration fantasy in a way that the, uh, you know, the fantasies of, say, the Elder Scrolls series weren't really being shattered. Because, look, it's a video game. Going into a, going through a door and having a short loading screen, that's kind of expected. It's not jarring. Yet, you take a look at the way that Starfield was stitched together, and that just is really jarring. Also, the industry has came along quite a bit, and it's fair to say that the dialogue is certainly bested by other titles. The thing is, though, and I believe some people in and around Larry have sort of commented on this, the problem, or at least the challenge that they face over at Bethesda is their games are, in a way, like... They're so big, but they also have quite a lot of freedom. So a conversation between a bunch of NPCs can sort of happen anywhere, which means that it's pretty hard to, you know, dynamically, like cinematically frame that to make it really immersive and feel great uh, for the player, right? So to me, ultimately, where this game falls apart is that they produced a lot of video game but they didn't necessarily push the formula forward. I mean, they did do things like the shipbuilding, which is neat, and being able to fly about the place, but none of that was really done in a way that I think added a tremendous amount to the experience, at least to the core experience that people actually go to that, um, I suppose, to that studio's games for. Interesting thing, kind of unfortunate. To be honest, though, I do think that, like, if you were to consider a next Elder Scrolls game, I think that that is fundamentally the sort of game format that far better suits what they're actually able to do. Because, look, you see a massive space game at that scale, you're kind of dealing with Star Citizen-like stuff, and as Star Citizen shows us, um, even if Star Citizen may not have always been the most efficient development process, it is fundamentally a very, very hard problem to solve. Now, we've also got the topic of just what the hell an independent game is anyway. And this has happened because of these indie games at the Game Awards. Cocoon, Dave the Diver, Dredge, Sea of Stars, and Viewfinder. Now, one of these is an in-house development by a billion-dollar company. And uh, the answer is, it's Dave the Diver, which is produced by Mint Rocket. They're an internal team at the South Korean mega-publisher Naxon. So, calling it an indie game is uh, very, very confusing and bizarre. Of course, it looks like an indie game, you know? It has pixel art. It has charm. It's likable. Certainly makes you think it's an indie game, uh, but no, it is not. In fact, I've even seen some um, some people saying that a game with a publisher of any form is not an indie game. Where I would push back is I would say it's about whether it's an independent studio or not. As an example, our video game, this one, The Pale Beyond, that was done with a publisher, Fellow Traveler. We're still an independent studio. They don't own the IP. They don't own our studio. We are an independent studio. This was a game made by an independent studio and our funding source and the people also helped us with marketing and many other things that our publishers are great for. Well, yes, they're a third party publisher. They're also very much an indie scale publisher in terms of the like amounts of money that they deal with, the sorts of uh, scopes of games that they greenlight. So you absolutely can be an indie studio. But that's actually where it gets kind of interesting because there are loads of studios that are independent but actually work with really big publishers that are essentially in the double A space. And I think that often is to say um, indie games, I think, can mean what we traditionally think of an indie game, but it also can be a large, I suppose, privately held studio that is, uh, you know, working with a publisher. Uh, I don't know. I mean, Tim Sweeney does own Epic Games, and that means that he owns Fortnite. Don't think we're going to start saying that Fortnite is an indie game, but hey, I suppose you get what I mean. This did lead to the fun graph that appeared from um, Agro Crab uh, Games um, of uh, just how the hell do you work out what an indie game is anyway? And uh, I would say that that funding neutral aesthetic rebel is probably the most correct of the takes. Ultimately, nobody's got anything against uh, Dave the Diver. It's an absolutely excellent game. I think it's more just uh, the Game Awards looking a little bit silly in um, them just being like, oh, Dave the Diver, totally indie game. Look at it. Look at it in Steam. What? It's made by Nexon, a multi billion South Korean mega publisher? Nah, it's an indie game. You can see pixels. Now then. Let's talk about decidedly not an indie game to close off today's show because Warner Brothers games, oh my God, they are quite something. So 
recently on the show, um, I, I, I told you guys about the whole situation where they're kind of looking at their games and uh, Mortal Kombat, live service, very, very happy. Hogwarts, I was about to say a Hogwarts Unchained, no. Hogwarts Legacy though, while well, it only happened to sell a gargantuan number of copies for full box price, but they did still talk about how they want to shift more and more things over to a live service format. Now, we got this idea then of a good game with a live service being shoved into it. And this is where I'm actually going to go way down in my document. I'm going to break the flow of the video just to point out something from Scott Hartsman, who uh, was once the CEO of Tryon Games. Uh, obviously, Tryon Games, so that means he is a big, big MMORPG veteran. And on his personal medium, he posted, should everything be a live game. And one of the things he says, um, basically, that the siren song of recurrent revenue is very tempting, but that ultimately you can't just add live to an existing IP and expect it to work because there's an entire art and craft to making video games that needs to be understood deeply. And he goes on to say that uh, the true live game successes are very rare because those are the games that are built from the very ground up to suit it, and they have audiences that are a perfect fit for that. And he ends with a quote that I just want to be like printed in the office of every major publisher. May you make the right choices for your players and studios while keeping investors and analysts at bay. Good luck. And the funny thing is, like with what he said, even the games that are from the ground up meant to be live services, like Destiny 2, are kind of buckling under their own weight as well. Now, to get back to the main story then, uh, perhaps we have another victim of the live services, because if you're tired of them, uh, yes, so am I, most of us are. We've got Sony's recent decision to delay half of theirs past March 2026. We've got Warner Brothers' statement saying they're basically going to double down on it, but get this, WCCF Tech have spotted a job for Monolith Productions' upcoming Wonder Woman game, uh, and it's, uh, it's for a lead software engineer, it asks for a lot, but one of the nice-to-haves pops out a lot more than the rest in the context of what Warner Brothers uh, games have recently said, and that is experience helping maintain a live software product or game. So, obviously, with the Suicide Squad game being uh, completely uh, berated for looking like a little bit of a mess, Bungie 2 sort of collapsing under its own weight, we then see like this. I mean, wh what are they going to do? How are they going to make Diana into a live service character? Is she going to have, like, different whip handles? Different, uh, I don't know, whip wires, whip ropes? Uh, di different, uh, you know, little, you know, you, you do the th you do the thing in the movie. You cross your arms, and then magic happens. We're gonna have different ones of those. How are you gonna make this into a live service game? There's two sides to it. You could either make a really, really good video game like the Guardians of the Galaxy one that Square Enix did, and uh, then because your Square Enix realized that it hasn't sold 55 million copies and be very disappointed by it, or you can pull an Insomniac and just make a damn good video game that people really like. And I guess that's where it's interesting because clearly in Omniac games make sense for PlayStation. However, if they're also system sellers for PlayStation, well, then maybe things get a little bit more rumbly because perhaps that well, that's what allows them to be what they are. And um, that's maybe what the people who would uh, try to make an excuse or a big uh, sort of explanation for why everything that's not first party has got to be live service. Maybe that's what they would say. I don't really know. But ultimately, this does seem to be a rather stupid direction to go in. And speaking of that, we do have to talk a little bit about Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League, uh, the very, very delayed game that has been in development for a stupidly long long amount of time because this game has actually had its gameplay sort of re-reveal. Um, I don't know exactly what to call it. I suppose it's like a web series that is running up to its release. And what we basically see in this is fairly interesting because looking through it, you do actually see loads of Rocksteady strengths. You've got, a, basically, it's a 20-minute look at story and gameplay. What they're showing off is certainly not groundbreaking, but it does look kind of compelling. They speak about an emphasis on character dialogue, on cutscenes, right? On the fantasy of being these DC characters and uh, just this big world, you know, that you can go around in where Metropolis is actually twice the size of Arkham Knight's Gotham City, that they have a big uh, focus on traversal and movement that just makes existing in the world fun. Oh, Obviously, anyone can then think of the Spider-Man games where movement is a, it's actually joyous how you move in the Insomniac Spider-Man games. The, the shooting kind of does just look like shooting, but at the very least, the characters sort of have different styles. They do different things. Of course, there's an unsettling tone beneath absolutely everything going on here. 
and I think this YouTube comment captures it. At Rocksteady, storytelling and character depth is at the core DNA of our game, which is why we're also making a live service shooter RPG. And that is the rough thing, because you can't really help but look at all of this stuff and understand that, uh, really, it's all going to be full of shoehorned in RPG elements, an itemization loop that probably doesn't make that much sense for the characters, and content that is built for repetition, as of course we saw, well, we've seen so disastrously in so many video games. I mean, if you grew up really enjoying just a good single-player game, I think there's little that makes you more disappointed than uh, hopping into a game and realizing that what you think is supposed to be a mission that you should should enjoy is in fact some sort of bizarre uh, repeatable dungeon thing. And honestly, looking at the tweets, looking at the Reddit comments, looking at the YouTube comments, they all pretty much say one thing, which is why the hell has this happened? And that's why I really wanted to bring up um, what was there from uh, Scott Hartsman, basically talking about like, why are you putting live service into things? If you're doing live service, it must be from the ground up. It must make sense for the IP, you know, all of those things, which is precisely not what uh, Rocksteady are even known for with the games that they produce. And ultimately, the most sad thing that could happen here is uh, that this will come out, that it will underperform, and then that cost cutting will happen, and maybe Rocksteady will be another one of the almost countless studios that have uh, experienced layoffs in recent times. It's, uh, yeah, I don't know, it potentially sucks. Cerny for Rocksteady, they're in this crazy position where what they were greenlit to do was kind of more in vogue in 2018, because whenever it was, because um, remember back then, that is still in and around the time where some people were actually excited for Anthem where people kind of wanted some competition to shake up the Destiny 2 space. And since then, we've obviously nothing but failure and failure and failure. So it's a bit strange for them. They are tasked with a near impossible battle. I cannot really see them win unless it ends up being the case that somewhere within this, there's a bunch of side content that you can ignore and a primary campaign that is actually good. Because I really do not see this being the sort of game that people will want to play uh, for, for, for a long time and, you know, in repeated fashion, like a live service game. Which, yeah, it's just a shame. And it does lead me to the very final thing where um, basically the developers behind uh, Like a Dragon Infinite have essentially said, actually, you know what, I'll, I'll just do their quotes. This means a lot of people are going to hesitate to play the game or will end up having to wait. And it's basically where the developers have said that this game is in fact so big and so long that, uh, well, th here's the quote. We have to get people to play this game in about a week or a month, even at the cost of their health, which is why it's our duty as creators to create a uh, to generate enough uh, to be excited about. They've basically said, right, their game is so big that it may be so daunting to people that uh, they may just put it off to a later date. And it might just sit in their shelf, or people just may not pick it up. But there is, in fact, so much content that in order to get people like into this game, they feel they need to generate so much of a hype and excitement way for it that people, uh, as as they even said, uh, play the game, you know, at the cost of their own health. Now, what he basically says is, um, you know, they should have a festival-like approach to the launch and that their PR is really targeted at just, uh, you know, hey, this is this is the most video game, the most Yakuza game of Yakuza games. Go play it. Basically, kind of channeling the same energy as an MMO launch. And to be honest with you, sometimes putting uh, a bit of fun first and uh, health second is fun within your hobby. Don't do it too much, but... I, for one, always see that Reddit post in r slash wow on the launch night of a new expansion where they say, now, now, it's a new expansion. What you should do is get your salad and uh, and your healthy meals and you should meal prep beforehand and you should track all your back. And in my head, I'm like, these are all very, very reasonable things to do. So I regret to inform you. I will have fish and chips and maybe a bag of Doritos. And perhaps that is why I am not a ripped World of Warcraft pvp -er like Bajira. I am indeed a slightly melted heroic mode raider. How depressing. And that is it for today's show. If you would like to support the team and also get the likes of our research documents, uh, before I even see them. Uh, loading screen, our daily newsletter that keeps you up to date with everything that's going on from, uh, you know, in the games industry, uh, from our team as well as other, many other lovely things. And also it is the best way to support our mission here because long-term, okay, look, obviously, 
We got mouths to feed, right? There's people to pay. As time goes on, I want, uh, you know, relatively speaking, AdSense revenue to go like this. And uh, honestly, like our um, our own platform revenue to go like this. Because the more that happens, the less we are dependent on platforms, advertisements, sponsors. That gives us more freedom to make the best possible content and ensures that um, our incentives are maximally aligned with yours. Because as much as the way that the advertisement-based model is pretty sweet for like, meaning you can just watch stuff and not have to pay for it. I think we also do um, all appreciate that there is a fine line and that it can be uh, rather detrimental to the media industry. So that's why I'm trying to honestly build uh, build a company and build a method of working that I feel I will actually really want to work in when I'm 40 in 11 years. And uh, that was kind of like the, the deeper thinking behind it that really spurred me on to um, just kind of gather the team together and really work out what we want to do in the future and what direction we want to go in. So there's that. You can check out uh, bellular.ghost.io. We'll have a proper URL soon. Some internet fuckery happened. Anyway, that's it for me. Have a wonderful day. I hope you enjoyed the show and I'll see you next time.